You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. We were flying over to Morocco and bringing stuff back for like 200 pound a, a kilo we were paying for it. And that stuff was great stuff as well, you know, straight from the Atlas Mountains. I bought a nightclub and then, I, and it's, I'm not involved in any crime at all at that time, right? And then cocaine came on the scene and um, things took a turn for the worst after that, to be honest. I was virtually a millionaire at 28. And then by the time I was 32, not like 88, 89, I was virtually skinned again. We went into uh, debt collecting and it weren't long before we were under arrest. The three of us were all under arrest for uh, extortion. But to test it out, I flew into France, uh, was given two kilos and I landed at the place in Kent and the bloke turned up, collected the two kilos and went, yeah, it's perfect. So that was the first one I've done was just two kilos, which normally is not worth starting the plane up for. And the bloke who got caught with me had two kilos and seven firearms, seven uh, Czechoslovakian semi-automatics. And that was it, you know, we were caught. When a judge is on another trial, right, across the other side of the country, he stops that trial just to drive back to sentence you, you know you're in trouble. And I was thinking to, me, thinking to myself, well, I'll probably end up with about 12 or 13 years, you know? Um, and then, of course, he gives me 25, but he had to knock a third off. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Sydney Wright. Sydney, yeah, how nice are you? Yeah, great stuff, great. You've gave us your book, phenomenal read, which we'll plug straight away. Yeah. Like the last London gangster, you yeah. were getting 25 years. You were yeah. cocaine pilot, basically. You were flying your own drugs and guns from Essex and bringing it over. Obviously, you get caught, but yeah. mad story. Like, you don't really hear people from the UK doing that sort of stuff. No, no, it was unusual. That was uh, basically, I was recruited in England. I knew I was a pilot, one of the, one of the, the, uh, the gang over in Amsterdam. And they approached me and uh, I don't know, my life was a bit boring at that time. And I thought, you know what, I'll have a go at this. And uh, we, we started working together, you know. Yeah, before we get into all the mad stuff, I always like to go back to the start with my guests. Yeah, sure. Where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was born in Hackney, East London, um, in the mid 50s. And um, I grew up in London was still very much a post-war city in those days. You know, even even when we used to play, we wouldn't say we'd meet you at the playground, it would meet you at the bomb site. You know, it was it was part of our, our language. Um and they were at that, that time they were doing a lot of clearance of old houses and building flats. So me and my friends, when we weren't at school, were in and out of houses. Um we used to weigh in old rags, get the lead out of the pipe, the lead piping out and out, you know, even when we were about nine years old, we used to uh, make a few bob that way, you know. How were you at school? Yeah, I was quite a good student at school, actually. I did quite well at school. I qualified for grammar school when I was 11. Um, and I was due to go to a school called Palmer's in Bethnal Green. It's quite a famous school. Um, However, my dad, my mum mainly wanted to move out of London at the time. The traffic was getting bad and it was, London wasn't really improving. So we, we moved to Essex when I was 11. Who was that for you? <laughs> oh, it was a, initially, it was a major wrench. Why? Well, because I came from sort of inner city, inner city lifestyle. Like I say, we could, I mean, I could strip the lead off a, a pub roof. When, when they emptied the, the streets out in those days to build flats, most streets had a pub at the end of them. And we used to have all the lead off the roofs and all that. And I went from that to sort of semi-suburbia in the space of, uh, you know, a week or so. So there's not many, much ways to make money back then? <laughs> no, I mean, money, money was really tight in the 60s, the early 60s. I mean, when we was a kid, I, I used to get about six pence a week, six old pence, which is two and a half P in today's money. Um, spending money a, a week, you know, 
And if we went and got a load of old rags from the, from the uh, houses, like curtains, old clothes that were left, lead piping, we used to take to what we called the rag shop and usually get something like about five bob for them. Well, five bob, which is 25p, was a lot of money then, you know? And we used to take that money and go to the calf and have egg and chips or egg bacon and chips or something, you know? How was your mum and dad with you as a kid? Oh, they were fantastic, honestly. Uh, my dad worked at Folds, had a good job at Folds, but because there was there was seven of us, seven children, you know, we never really had much money. Uh, all his money went basically on on bringing the family up, you know. So a loving family. That a lot of people who aren't of you who end up in prison, a a life of crime usually come from the broken home. Yeah, not the dad not there. Or, like you had the loving family and you've kind of... No, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the case with me. We, we had a fantastic family, very, very tight-knit. Um, my dad was a sort of pillar of the community, run a football team, um, uh, Chingford Clarions. And, um, you know, we had a great family house. It was, it was you, you, you walked inside our house when I was a kid and it was warmth and love, you know, no two ways about it. So I've got no excuses there. I couldn't turn around and say the life I had involved in crime was down to my family upbringing, not at all. When did you end up getting involved in the serious stuff? What age? Um, serious stuff really was probably about 23, 24 onwards. What did you do before that? Would you ever have a job or anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I left school when I was 16 um, and I worked. No, no, sorry. I went to college for a year. What did you do? Uh, economics and economic history. Why did you choose that? Level. Well, one, it involved money and, and, and learning about business and that with economics. And economic history, I, it was because of history, I was pretty particularly gifted at it at school, you know. Um, that was my favourite subject and I was just naturally good at it. So you just, you had to go at that? Why yeah. did you Why did you move away from it? Well, I got a job in London as an apprentice underwriter. Um, I was taking a, what they call ACII, um, which is like Associated Chartered Institute of Insurance exams and everything. But I was earning £16 a week in those days. Like this is 1973 we're going back to now. And £16 a week, my, my train fares was £16 a month, coincidentally. And I just, that where all my mates were buying nice cars like Lotus, Cortinas and things, I just never had any money, you know. So I stood that for about a year and then I packed the job in, you know. Do you regret that decision now? Um, Many years not later. really, because what it was, it was, it was stability and would have led to me being, eventually being an underwriter. Um, but I'll, if I'm brutally honest with myself, I would have been bored with it. Um, getting the train every day to work, commuting, um, the same old stuff every day. Although I'd been earning, a, by the time I was an underwriter, I'd been earning a lot of money, it would have been very boring. So you, still have, you, you had a good career in that, because we'll touch on later in the interview that you are a very crafty writer, you are an amazing writer. But when you leave that then, was it the attraction of the fancy cars, the fancy suits back in the 60s and 70s? I think there? it was, yeah. In, 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 in the mid-70s, I mean, the 70s were a very hard decade you know, in comparison to today. And um, when I left my job in, in the city, it weren't long before I was, got my first sentence in jail. Um, I basically got in a fight, a friend of mine got in a fight at a, a club, a, a, a rugby club, uh, do, like a disco. Um, and I said, if anyone joined in, I'd, I'd back him up. And he had a fight with this bloke and basically two rugby players went in and I knocked them both out. And uh, unfortunately, I got nicked for it. One yeah. of them got a cut eye. <clears throat> so it constituted actual bodily harm. And um, I ended up getting six months detention centre. And, and trust me, detention centre in those days was tough. It was the hardest. I mean, I, I prayed to get a ball stall. Although the ball stall was a longer sentence, detention centres were that hard. Um, you know, it really was uh, tough. Was that a wake-up call for you? Um, How did it? Because when you I'll tell you what it did. The detention centres in those days turned you into... Did you ever see the film Scum? Yeah. Right, well, what happened to him in there, Ray Winston, who, who's a distant relative of mine, right? 
actually happened to me in real life. I was in the detention centre for 10 days and it was full of, it was on Holosey Bay Detention Centre. Um, and within 10 days, I had a fight with the top, what they called the top boy in there. A bloke called Tony Scott, if he's watching, he, he, was, he was a hard case. And I was lucky enough that I beat him. And after I beat him, I became the top boy in there. And then it made it a lot easier for me. You know, no one picked fights with me. I wasn't bullied at all. Um, I got first choice at all the cigarettes and I could smoke him with bandit. You couldn't smoke in detention centers, but we used to get some black market tobacco and um, I had access to all that. So it made life a bit easier. So you could scrap back then if you're knocking out rugby players and becoming top Yeah, well, boy. I took up boxing when I was um, 16 at South End Club and um, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't the greatest boxer in the world, but I could knock people out with either a left hook or a right hand. No no problem at all, you know. What sort of respect then do you have as a kid if you're a top boy in a detention centre? Did that become uh, then an attraction again? Yeah, 100%, without a doubt. I mean, like I say, detention centres without a doubt. I mean, I remember one kid coming in there that couldn't hack it and the place was that bad. He went back to his room and took a razor and cut all his face wide open just to get in hospital to get out of there. That's what it was like. It was that there was tremendous bullying going on in there. And it was, you were up at six o'clock every morning. You had to uh, cold shower, um, then breakfast, then work parade. Then you went to work all morning. Then you went to the gym in the afternoon for an hour um, after lunch. Um, and then in the evening, usually, especially if you'd been a bad boy like I had, you were scrubbing floors till nine o'clock at night, you know? So it was it was a real bad, it was real hard bird. See, if you're weak in those environments, the, does tough men sniff that out or bullies sniff that out, who the weakest is straight away? Oh, honestly, they were like, it was like an animal existence in there. They, they, the bullies sniffed out the weak ones within literally 10 seconds. It was that, that quick. What's it like for your mum and dad to come and visit you as a kid who's got potential to be something to then <sighs> ends up in detention well, centre? They, they, yeah, they were bitterly disappointed with me, but... Then again, you see, if, if I'd have been in detention centre, say, for burglary or something, some nasty sort of crime, um, you know, distasteful crime, I was in there for an honour crime, right? My friend got in a fight and I said, if anyone joined in, I'd back him up. Two big rugby players went in. They turned on me, but unluckily for them, although I was only about 10 stone, I could punch like a middleweight or a light heavyweight. And uh, I landed a couple of punches on them and put them away, you know. That, to me, was an honour crime. Even if I could turn the clock back now, I would still do, done the same, right? I wouldn't let my mate go into that fight with two big rugby players on his back, you know. So, you know, I've got no... I wasn't disgraced at all, and my dad knew that. You know, my dad always told me, you stand by your friends, you know. Self-defence. It was self-defense because the two rugby players, when I, I steamed in and said, I oh, leave him alone, they turned on me. The two of them turned on me. And um, unfortunately, one of them I put away quite clean with a right hand. The, the second one, I caught him um, in the eye and it cut his eye. And that was the ABH. What did you do after the detention center? <sighs> well, I came out of detention center in, I'll tell you what it was, November 1974. And my best friend came round me flat the next, around my house the next day because I was back at home with mum and dad. I said, listen, Sid, I've got you a job odd carrying. What's that? Uh, in those days, it was the, probably the hardest job you could ever have. You were carrying bricks and cement up sometimes 30 foot ladders to bricklayers. Um, but you know what? I loved it. And it got me so fit. I mean, I still, my mum's, I think, still got the press cuttings at home. When I came out and, and, and did the odd carrying, I had three boxing matches in 10 days and I knocked all three out within two rounds because I was so so fit coming out of detention centre and then doing the odd carrying, you know, made me even better. Why did you never stuck in at the boxing? Uh, I wasn't good enough to make the top, honestly. Um, when all the money, all the money in boxing in those days, and it probably still the same now, is at the very top of the game. Um, you know, in, in those days, 
your first, say, 10 pro fights, you're getting about 250 quid a fight in those days. Well, I was earning 100 pound a week odd carrying, you know, so mm. it just didn't, it, and, and again, I would never have made the top. Uh, even now, I think the top 1% of boxers are only ones who make money. I had Joe Kozaki yeah. on last year. He was 22 and 0, world champion, and he owed money to yeah, promoters. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and you've got to remember, the time I, I used to box at welterweight, at the time I was around, and, and say if I did have Asper, I remember I went one time in 1977, um, I scored 14 consecutive knockouts, right? Not at the highest standard of the amateur game, but a reasonable standard of fighter. Now, you know, it doesn't sound much, 14 on the chart, but you try and do it, right? 14 on the chart. And people were talking about me being a potential champion and that. But you know, the champs were earning the money at that time was Ray Leonard and Tommy Hearns and Marvin Hagler. Now, there's no way on this earth that I was going to beat those guys, right? Not, not a chance in the world was I going to beat those guys. So I stayed out of it, you know. Is that another, do you regret that now? No, I don't regret it at all. I think it's the most sensible decision I ever made because I, I'd, have, I'd have ended up with uh, probably earning a lot of money because I could punch hard, right? But, but 14, have... 14 and 0 is good though. That's, <laughs> that's a class start. Well, I, I stopped 14, stopped, I knocked out 14 on the trot. That was in the amateur game, mm -hmm. right? Um, and obviously I had a few offers to turn professional mainly because I was a very good puncher. I wasn't a great boxer, right? But I could, I could knock anyone out with a left hook or a right hand, no problem. Just tough. And, and I could take a shot, yeah, I could. I could take a shot. What did you do after your job then, 100 quid a week? Was that not enough for you? Uh, well, what, well, I was odd carrying, believe it or not. I don't know if you've heard of a thing called a 714. No. Well, it was a tax exemption certificate, right? Mm -hmm. And what you did was you worked in those days, say you was a bricklayer or a hod carrier. And say you earned 100 quid that week, right? You wrote out the 714 and you got, they, the employer put that in for tax relief, right? It was, it was your way of paying tax. Then you got a bill at the end of the year from the tax people, depending, depending on how many 714s you put in. Well, I was offered bent book, what they used to call a bent book and ticket. And um, I was signing away bricklayer's work and earning an extra 50 on top, mm -hmm. you know? It wasn't just me doing it, a lot of people were doing it. In fact, I signed away nearly all the brickwork on Rayleigh Police Station. <laughs> and and years, years later, I was actually locked up in Rayleigh Police Station and looked at the brickwork and knew that I'd signed it away, mm -hmm. you know? Was that never enough for you, making a bit of dough, <sighs> keeping fit? What was, the, what was the extra attraction that you wanted to get involved in serious crime? Um, Yes, yeah, good question. Uh, I don't think at that time I really had a desire to be involved in serious crime. I was just on the on the on the fringes of it. Uh, like I say, I used to do bent book and tickets for the tax. Um, and around about 1977, I used to drive up to London and buy cannabis in the block. In those days, it wasn't in kilos; it was in what they called weight, which was a pound. And I still remember the price I used to pay. I used to pay 320 quid for it. I used to drive it back to South End, give it out to a couple of dealers, and then we'd carve the money up at the end of the week. So I was nicking about 200 pound a week out of that, which doesn't sound much now, but 200 pound a week in 1977 was a lot of money. And I was happy just to be in that, you know, uh, a small fish as such. But then the greed kicks in, always. Um, you always want more, don't you? Yeah. I suppose you know. Um, so why was why wasn't it kilos? Why was it only half kilos then? Were they pound? Well, it was the old. It was before everything went metric. It was um, you know. I used to go up to London. And I still remember the price. I used to buy grade A Moroccan for three hundred and twenty pound a weight, and the weight was one pound uh, in weight. You know, and I used to give. I used to buy two of those, give them to two dealers. And then at the end of the week, we'd carve the money up. You know, I used to split the profit with them. What was the hash like back then? Soft oh, black? It was, it was fantastic. Proper. It was, honestly, the, the Moroccan that I used to get in those days, they used to call it double zero, I think they called it. If I, you know, go, I'm thinking back, it's nearly 50 years ago. Uh, it was double zero and that stuff, 
you know, you'd have one joint of that and you weren't going out. <laughs> you, know, you know, your feet, you had your slippers on with a telly yeah. on, you know. Yeah, my old granddad, he, he was in his 80s and he was still smoking hash, like, but it was called soft black and it was fucking strong. Oh, that was the stuff like putty, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, and you know, it was strong because my wee nephew used it to... It had the red stripe yeah, on it when yeah, it came yeah, to the yeah. pack, that's yeah. right. Yeah, my, yeah, my wee yeah. nephew used to steal bits, but we used to have a couple of joints, but it would yeah. blow your fucking head off. Well, I mean, you know, later on in the story, I'll tell you, we were, when I, I lived in the Canary Islands from 1989 to 1992, um, I, we were flying over to Morocco and bringing stuff back for like 200 pound a, a kilo we were paying for it. And that stuff was great stuff as well, you know, straight from the Atlas Mountains. So when you're only doing, shifting a pound, making a couple of hundred quid, which is good money back in yeah, the 70s, it was, it was. did you then start to get the business head on and thinking you can make more? Yeah, I think at no, that time, honestly, what I, what I honestly looked at crime as was, was to, to earn money so I could put it into legitimate business. I was a very good mechanic. And I wanted to have, have eventually have my own garage with an MOT station in and all that stuff. And I had a friend of mine at the time, Eric, who was a great welder. Um, and we intended to go into straight business together. So the money I earned from my illicit uh, affairs as such, right, I, I wanted to put into legitimate business. Where did you get the, those business strategies to then try to become a businessman, to try and go legit? You just learn as you went along, you know. I mean, I used to repair people's cars and... Uh, and I'd see people take their cars to normal garages and they might want, say, 100 quid's worth of work, but the garage would quote them 200, you know. And I knew there was an opening where we could earn good money by being fair, basically, you know. When did you start upping your shipments from a pound to then working in the higher loads? Um, no, not at that time I didn't. I packed in, we, we, we all got nicked in 1979. What for? Uh, cannabis and um, receiving stolen goods. Yeah. And I also had another, uh, I'd agree with bodily arm as well. What was the cannabis then? Was that a class C? No, it was class B. In the 70s? It had always been class B. Oh, I thought it went up again, then it came back no, down. No, no, I'll tell you what, it went, it went down around about 10, 15 years ago, didn't it? Mm -hmm. To class C. Yeah. And then they re-upped it to class B again. I always thought it was C, then they put it to B. No, it was class B in those days. Was that? But yeah. I don't think the hardware drugs was out then, was if it? You, if, you got, if you got caught, I mean, um, we, we got jailed. I'll tell you when I got jailed. Uh, December 79, I got jailed. Um, I got nine months, then I got two years concurrent straight afterwards for the cannabis and uh, stolen office equipment. Um, so I ended up with two years. Um, and the standard issue at that time for, for cannabis dealing was about between nine and 18 months, you know. What was it like? Was that the first time you were in adult prison? Yeah, I was in Wormwood Scrubs then, yeah. What's first that time. like? Detentions and Bostels, they know they're tough, but adults is a different <laughs> ball game as well. Yeah, I mean... Nowhere near as tough as the detention centre. Um, Wormwood Scrubs in 1979 was boring. You know, you were 23 hours a day in a cell, three of you in one, one cell, 10, by, 10 foot by six. And it was just boring, you know? There what? wasn't the bullying, there wasn't the bullying that you got in the detention centre, there wasn't the fights that you got in detention centre, but it was just a bore. You know, slopping out as well, slopping out every morning. You know, you, the door would open, you slopped out first thing, you had your bucket full of piss or whatever. No one's shit in the cells in those days, you wouldn't have it, right? If anyone had diarrhea or whatever, you'd done it in a shirt and it went out the window, right? That, that was everybody did that. No one slept in the cells, you know, if there's three of you in there and one of them's had a shit in the bucket, he's going to get his head punched in, you know, it ain't going to happen. Um, so basically, you either held it till the morning or you did it in the shirt and it went out the window. Uh, that's the, <laughs> that's that's the truth. That's mad, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's, that's the truth. And the same with washing, you know, we, we used to wash down in a bowl every, every night. You walk, because you only got a shower once a week in those days. And we'd wash down in a bowl and then the bowl of dirty water went out the window, you know. Uh, all down the walls of the, of the prison, you know. What was the screws like then in the seventies? Roofless. They were. I'll tell you what. They were mainly in those days. A hell of a lot of them were ex-army. 
in the 70s. Um, they'd done their national service or they'd actually been in regiments in the army. And a, a great deal of them were decent blokes. They just, they just let you get on with it, you know? Um, you had one or two bastards in there. I mean, I remember the screws that run the block in, in, uh, in Wormwood Scrubs. I mean, they were infamous. They later all got jailed. They all got 15 years each, I think. You know, and they would beat you up. If you got, if you got in trouble, you got in a fight in there, especially if you hit a, hit a screw, you went to the block and you got pasted. Trust me on that. So after year two then, are you thinking to go out and try and start your business again or are you just <laughs> thinking about doing the dodgy stuff? No, at that time, honestly, I really wanted to go straight because my wife had had a, uh, we'd had a daughter while I was in there. She stood by me and visited me all the time and everything. And, um, you know, I really, when I came out, I just went straight to work with my partner. He got a workshop down, down in South End, near South End United's football ground. And I went to work there as a mechanic. He did the welding and I did all the mechanical work on cars, you know. How hard is that when you're in prison and your daughter's born? <sighs> yeah, it's this, you, you just feel detached, you know. Um, it was my first child, so the same as any man, you know, you're really pleased. But at the same time, you're, you're really frustrated that you can't really, you know, I didn't want my wife to bring the baby to the prison. So my wife used to come and leave the baby at home. You know, I wouldn't have it. Um, and the baby was born in May of 1980. And I, I was released in uh, the December. So I went six, six months, seven months without seeing her, you know, which was hard. So you came out, you've got the head on, you're trying to go straight. Yeah, definitely. How do you get sucked back in again? Well, I'll tell you what, in the, in the car trade, you know, I mean, in those days, I used to put an advert in the paper that I bought MOT fannies and any motors. So I was buying a lot of cars and uh, never anything stolen. It was all straight. But in the car trade, you meet people, you know. I mean, I can remember, I think it must have been about the middle of 1981, uh, getting hold of bent £20 notes, you know. All of a sudden, someone in the car trade went to me, listen, Sid, you know, we can get this. I went, yeah, I'll have a look at them. And I was buying 20 pound notes for a fiver, you know. Cashing some myself, which I did, right? But at the same token, I was, I was selling a load of them for tenors, you know. So I was, again, not really involved. I was on the fringes of crime again, really, you know, mm -hmm. as part and parcel of just being. And also, as well, we were getting dodgy MOTs. For cars, you know, we were. It's part of the business in, in those days. It's not so much now because they've got it nailed down now. But back in the early eighties, late seventies, early eighties, you know, dodgy MOTs. I used to be able to get insurance certificates. You know, that type of thing was quite commonplace. Yeah, you know, my family were all the same. Like everything was dodgy. We always had one meter rigged, free electricity. Everything we used to use the X-ray. Used to get when an X-ray used to come. Used to show from like a blue sheet of paper. Yeah. If you cut that and put it round. It used the, to go through the crack in the meter. Yeah, and it used to right. stop it that's and stop right. your meter. Like. You could use a photo out of a camera as well. Yeah, that's right. film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And it used to stop. Yeah, every time. Stop that's it. why even now when my door goes, I don't answer it. Because back in the day when my mum and dad's door went, it was fucking get down. It's either the gas man the t t yeah. or somebody was out looking for them. So they had to pull out plugs and pins and well years later when i was in the bed and breakfast business you know and a lot of houses with people living in in bed sits and bed and breakfast we were at it all the time with the electric you had to be mm -hmm. because the electric bills from when i mean some of my houses that i owned i had like 10 different rooms in them all using electric you imagine the electric bills would put you out of business so uh we used to either do the film that you said put the, the camera film down the side or if you've got a, a, a length of wire that's the same as the, the, that goes in the bottom of the meter and connect the two end terminals, it bypassed it. Mm -hmm. So instead of going through and spinning the wheel quick, it bypassed it and made it go slow, you know. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of just trying to keep your head above water, looking for yeah. easy turns, quick turns, not that much money, but you're making enough to then provide for your family. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just about. How did you go deeper again though? Like, why take um, that leap? Well, at that time, really, I'll tell you what happened at that time. I, we, we started doing well, me and my partner. I went from literally earning about 50 quid a week in probably 1981 
So by the end of 82, I was earning about 500 pound a week, like selling cars and doing repairs. At that time I had two people working for me, mechanics. And um, I, start, I started buying houses. We got into the housing business. My, my, my landlord down at our workshop was a bloke called Burke Ballard. He was the richest bloke in South End, right? He had houses everywhere. And what he, what he did have trouble with though was problem tenants, right? So he used to take me with him and say, well, if you don't move out, you're going to have to deal with Sid, you know? And I'd, I'd say, they all knew me by that time through my boxing and everything. And um, I used to get his tenants out for him and that, you know, that were, were problem tenants. Um, and he introduced me to the property business where I basically started buying houses and renting the rooms out, bed and breakfast and bed sits, you know? So I'd buy a house. In those days, say off Lee Broadway, it was cost, I mean, my first one cost me 26 grand. My mortgage repayments were about 300 a month. And I was getting 300 pound a week renting the rooms out. So it don't need to be a genius to work out. It was quite profitable. Mm -hmm. um, and of course we were fiddling the electric and that as well, you know, thrown into the bargain, but we, we, we had to. Um, and I ended up, how many houses did I have? I ended up with about 85 tenants in about 12 houses, you know. Um, so I was doing quite well. So you're doing well though, you're making dough, you're filling your house, is that? Yeah. Why is it in our minds that we have to go down? Is it the, well, is it the turn tell, on or is it? No, yeah? what happened was, um, you know, I started converting my houses into flats and making serious money, you know. Then, then it went from... I had certain houses that I'd say paid 30 grand for. I'll give you one example, Seven Britannia Road. I paid 33,000 for it. Bed and breakfasted it out for a couple of years, converted it to four flats and got 50,000 for each flat. Now that's a lot of money and going back 40 years ago. And I had about six or seven houses like that, you know. Um, I bought a nightclub and then, and it's not involved in any crime at all at that time, right? And then cocaine came on the scene and um, things took a turn for the worst after that, to be honest. What neat club did you have? I had, a, I had a club down Station Road called the Swag Club, it was called. It's a fucking good name, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good name, yeah. yeah. And uh, sold about a guarantee, that means. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was a fantastic time of being alive. This was the mid 80s, about 1986, 87. Fantastic time of being alive, but... Uh, the, the depression was coming, coming on its way, you know. Was there much trouble in these nightclubs in the 80s? My, my club was famous for never having a fight in. Because you were the owner? Well, that partly because of that, partly because people really liked me, partly because they knew that if they did start a fight in there in trouble, they're gonna get, they're gonna come second, you know. Um, I had a couple of really good doormen on the, on the door at the time as well. Uh, and people actually said to me, when the club eventually got shut down by the police, people actually came up to me and said, you know what, Sid, open another club because we felt so... People that were non-violent completely, lovely people, said to me, we felt safe in your club, you know. No one was going to come up and punch us in the face because we were enjoying ourselves, all that sort of thing, you know. Yeah, did you feel in the 80s then, when the coke started coming in, did you see the changes in people in nightclubs actually yeah, say cocaine? Yeah, definitely. Definitely, you see, yeah, and I mean, I, I, I sadly, um, I got, I was, I was on the coke myself, you know. I think nearly everybody got on it, and the reputation of, of cocaine at that time was it was a safe drug. You know, it was a type of drug you could have a few lines, enjoy yourself, and there was no come down. Uh, there was no dependency on it, you know. It, it looked like the perfect drug. Yeah, it was Scarface and that's out at the time as well. People are loving those films. Oh, it's, it's it's Scarface, yeah, made it fashionable as well, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. What was it like taking your first line? First line of coke was, wow, you know, this, this, <laughs> this, is, this is the drug to be on, you know. It was, I can still remember it, you know. Where were you? Uh, it was in my, my nightclub, yeah. Um, and it was, you, you talked all night, you had a big smile on your face, you know. The only trouble with coke was you had to keep topping it up. Um, you know, before cocaine come along, there was sulfate, whiz. 
and you could have a couple of dabs of that and you'd be flying all night. With cocaine, after about 10, 15 minutes, you had to top it up with another line, you know. How much was it for a gram back then, 50? Uh, it was 50 quid. Ain't yeah. it mad that it never changed for 20, years? Yeah, but years? you've got to remember, the 50 quid back in the mid-80s was a week, person's week's wages. Mm -hmm. So 50 quid in, the, say, 1985 is like 400 quid today. So it's yeah. the equivalent of 400 quid a gram. But then back in the day, because when I started taking coke, a 50 quid bit would last you six hours, seven hours. Like nowadays, people are just battering a gram out in one line, two lines. Like back then, I'd imagine people were chipping in three, four of them to get a gram, enjoying yeah. their night up the road at six. Like. That's right, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I, if I had a gram, genuinely, if I had a gram of coke, I would probably get probably about 15 lines out of that. You know, mm -hmm. and I'd make it spread over, over the course of an evening, you know. Um, where the trouble with coke came was when you went back, you say you shut the club up or whatever, you went back to someone's house and everyone just flopped to the kitchen and then it was just non-stop chopping all night long, you know. And nothing, that used to yeah. go on. Nothing's changed. No, nothing. I dare, I dare say it's still the same today. No, nothing's yeah. fucking changed. Like, yeah. Did it start getting a grip of you then? Start getting a grip of your businesses, who you were as an yeah, individual? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I started making mistakes, you know, that I'd never done before in uh, in business and that. I just weren't bothered anymore. All I, all I could think about really was getting out the weekends and, and getting on it. And uh, I never used to be like that, you know, before, about, before cocaine come along. When did you see it that it was kind of damaging your reputation and your businesses? Um, around about 1988, that was. And I realised, and then the slump came as well, the business slump came then. I mean, flats that were 50 grand, I was getting 50 grand for, suddenly you couldn't get 15 grand from. You couldn't sell anything. And um, I think the base rate went to about 18% in 1988, 89. And it all, you know, and then the more sort of financial things got harder, the more coke you took to relieve it. Do you know what I mean? So it was a, it was a vicious circle, really. Yeah, so you started to see a massive dent in your own money in the recession? Yeah. Um, you know, like I say, I made a few mistakes. I bought a few places with the bank's money that I shouldn't have done. Um, I hung on to places longer when I should have sold them as flats. And I made some, t some terrible mistakes. I mean... I was virtually a millionaire at 28, and then by the time I was 32, not like 88, 89, I was virtually skinned again, you know. Is that how you ended up back getting involved in crime? Yeah, well then what I did was, luckily for me, I'd bought a lovely place I had in Tenerife, a villa in Tenerife. So I realised that the, you know, the, the shit had hit the fan in England. So me, my wife, and my daughter, and my wife was pregnant again as well, uh, we went over to Tenerife uh, and uh, we lived over there for uh, two years. Are you trying to start a clean life, a new life, or was it trying to get back involved in crime? No, Tenerife was straight away. Quite, Tenerife at that, in those days, Las Americas and Los Cristianos was crime capital, full stop. It was, it was believe me. Um, it was so bad there that the, the Spanish had to send the nationals, the police there. Uh, the Guardia Seville and the Policia Locale couldn't handle it. So they sent the, uh, the nationals in there. Why do, how do you think you always get sucked back in? I think a lot of it is, is, you know, you're susceptible to it. You consider it to be a little bit glamorous. And also by association. The you circle know, you keep. It's, it's the people you know and they, they're in the know. They know someone that's got this or they could do that, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, even when I was over in Tenerife, straight away I was in with, not the, the exclusively the criminal fraternity, but people living on the edge. Let's, let's phrase it that way, you know. So you get back involved again in Tenerife? Yeah, I did, yeah. What were you doing this time? I was flying in uh, cannabis from um, the Atlas Mountains. You were flying it in or someone else? No, me, I flew it in. Where did you get the, the, the pilot's license? Uh, I passed that in England in 1985. Was that always your agenda to no, do that? No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I, like I told you, I was earning a lot of money in the mid-80s, and uh, a friend of mine 
took me flying one day because he, he'd qualified as a pilot. <clears throat> and I sort of said to him, look, you know, what do you have to do to qualify? And he told me. So I went and did it, you know. How long did it take you? Um, I, I passed through in 38 hours. What? 38 hours. Did it take years to or months? No, no, I did it in 38 hours. Is that like um, a crash course? No, no, no. I did it. I, I was probably flying probably a two hours a week. So I did it in the space of about 18 weeks. Mm. And um, what it is with flying in those days, I don't know about the test these days because, I mean, I passed mine back in 85, 86. Um, if you were naturally quite good, you passed in about 35, 36 hours. If you were good, you passed in under 40, which I did. So I was just considered as good, not exceptionally good, just good. And if you were a bit of a donkey, it could take you 50 hours plus, you know? It just depended how, how good you were. What's it like flying a plane for the first time? Yourself? <sighs> I'll tell you what's the most frightening thing in the world is, is where you, you go for your lessons, right? And, and you've obviously with an instructor, right? So you're up there 1,500 feet up, you're with an instructor and he lands the plane. Then you start to land it, but you've always got him sitting next to you. And one day, without any warning, he gets out the plane and says to you, right, he did this to me after nine hours of flying, right, up you go on your own. And then suddenly you're up in the air, 1,500 feet up, and you know if you don't bring that plane down right, you're going to die. That is frightening. Trust me, that is really scary. Never mind if you've got a pass on the back as well now. So you're in Tenerife. What was it like getting your first shipment when you're flying? What was the plan? What, with the, with the cannabis? Yeah. Well, basically, it was just to get down to the underground of roughly a place called Agadir. Um, they had a car waiting over there where they brought the uh, the cannabis down from and then load the plane up and go. You know, no one took any any notice of you then in there at all, you know. But, but what, what I used to do was instead of being at the airfield in, in Agadir where you could potentially get nicked, I used to land about five miles between there and the Atlas Mountains. And then, um, you know, then, then you knew you were safe then. What was your first shipment you brought over? Uh, first one was 25 kilos, I think it was. How much are you paying for a kilo then? 200 quid we used to pay. What are you shifting it for, 800? No, we used to do most of it where people would come over for an holiday from a lot of our customers from Liverpool. And, um, Apart from some of the stuff that we sold in Tenerife, right, which was quite minimal, most of our custom went to people coming on holiday from Liverpool because they were going back to Liverpool Airport in those days. There was no customs. They just used to land there and walk straight through. Um, we were selling it for 1500 a key. Oh, back then? Yep. 1500 They used to get back in Liverpool and they would sell it out in nine bars. Um, and they were, I think they were getting about 600 quid for nine ounces. So four lots, 600. They were earning about a grand on every kilo. Uh -huh. So yeah. they were just filling, because I know people in Glasgow, they used to take kids over on the school bus to Spain. Yeah. Fucking load the bus with hash yeah. in with their bags and drive home with the school kids. That's, like, that's exactly, yeah. I mean, I don't think they were, the, 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 the people from Liverpool were involved with children, but... I remember talking to my mate and I said, well, what's the customs like at Liverpool? You know, this is about 1991. He said, what customs? You know. To the dodo. They, were, they weren't as if they were coming in from um, South America or somewhere really suspicious. They were just coming in from Tenerife, you know. Yeah. Cause they I just used to wave them through. Ricky Hayes from Glasgow, I think they, they wrote a book. They used to bring it indoors. They used to fill the door panels up and take it through in truckloads back in the 80s and 90s? <laughs> well, I think in those days, you could probably buy it on the Spanish mainland for about six, 700 a kilo, wasn't it? I believe. Yeah. Um, but as I say, we on, on the islands in Tenerife, we used to get 1,500 for it. And uh, they were happy to buy it, you know. Are you doing it yourself? What, cannabis? Yeah. I'd have a little joint at the end of the day just to relax if I watched the film, you know what I mean? I wasn't the type of bloke that was smoking in the daytime or anything. Mm -hmm. So you've got their pilot's license, you're deciding to fly, pick up kilos, making that 
massive profit. Yeah. Like, with your mindset, then you always wanted more. Did your shipment start getting bigger, or did you just decide to just keep it? Alive? No, we kept it. We kept it at that because I tell you why. Because I used to land at an airfield airport called Los Rodios in the north of the island, and we had the bloke, the bloke on the ground there. We had him on the panel. We used to look after him with a few quid, and. Um, to carry more out of there, out of Lost, put it this way, to carry more out of there would have attracted attention. The fact we kept it down to like 25 kilos, split into two, two bags, because there'd be two of us on the plane, it never showed up. If we started getting greedy, say 100 kilos at a time, and there was no need for it, you know, because we'd, um, we'd only shift 25 kilos within a certain specific amount of time, you know. Mm -hmm. And if we if we got hundred kilos, we'd just be sitting on it. So it was it wasn't worth it, you know. How long were you doing that for? Twenty. You got to remember, twenty five kilos. You know, we were earning about thirty five grand out of that. Well, mm. that was a lot of money in in uh, nineteen ninety one. How long were you doing that for? I did that for about eighteen months. And then what happened after that? The national they moved. I told you just now they moved the nationals. The police came in and um, they started doing surveillances because at that time as well we were moving quite a bit of sulphate. You know, whiz. Mm -hmm. We were moving a fair bit of that around, and um, I realised that the net was going to close in on me eventually. A few people knew what I was up to. A few people I didn't trust also knew. You know what I mean? And if they got caught for something, they were going to trade me off. That's the way I thought, and I was probably right. So uh, I called it a day. Did you feel the heat coming from the corpus? And yeah, definitely. Um, I wasn't under any surveillance, to my knowledge, but I I, I knew that they, they someone very close to me, a guy called Mark. He got lifted and got five years, and I was the next one up the chain. So it was only a, a, a matter of time, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And there was other people that were definitely under surveillance and that, that knew about my activities that could have traded me off and probably would have traded me off, you know? Do you think a lot of snitches and informants back then? Oh, mate, there, there always has been. It don't matter if you go back to the 60s, the 50s, the 70s, the 80s, there's always been informants. The police, the police are nothing without informants. You know, they couldn't catch a cold. <clears throat> um, it's always informants, you know. Yeah. And I, I, in 1992, well, I was earning a lot of money and I put money away as well, right? So I, I hadn't squandered it. I, I knew that, that probably within a year, if I'd carried on, I'd have got nicked, definitely. So what did you do after the 18 months? Well, I came back to England where I was wanted, actually. I was wanted in England for land frauds. We'd done some, uh, we committed some frauds back in the 80s with uh, council grants. There was a massive trial in Essex. The biggest trial in the history of Essex Police was the uh, South End Council grants frauds. I was caught up in that. Um, so I couldn't land at Gatwick, so I knew they had a block on me at Gatwick. I had to come in at Manchester. I landed at Manchester Airport and uh, filtered my way back into uh, South End, you know. How long were you on the run for? Um, the two years I was in the Canaries. I was wanted for those whole two years. Did you hand yourself in when you got back to the UK? No, they surrounded, I was in a bungalow in Rayleigh and they surrounded it with armed police. Why they armed, I, I, why they're armed, I don't know. Yeah, for fraud? Because I was, yeah, yeah for fraud. But they surrounded it with a bungalow with armed police and uh, obviously came in, we let them in. You know, I, I didn't even put up any resistance as, as, if, as if I could. Yeah, what happened with that case? Uh, well, I was put on remand straight away, obviously, because I jumped bail, you know, I was wanted. Um, and I was on the same wing, funny enough, as Pat Tate and Nipper. Nipper is my brother-in-law and we all know who Pat Tate is, don't we? Um, and within one day, they moved Pat Tate to uh, Swaleside on the Isle of Sheppey. And the reason was they wouldn't have the two of us on the same wing together. <laughs> right, me and Pat. Um, he was quite a character, Pat. But uh, anyway, I spent six weeks on remand for that. 
and they produced me at Chelmsford Crown Court in front of a judge there, uh, Judge Watlin, who was the toughest judge at that time in Chelmsford. However, he made it clear to my barrister, Nigel Liftman, who was a personal friend of mine, as well as being my barrister, and he's now the top judge of the Old Bailey, Nigel Liftman, um, made it clear to Nigel Liftman that if I pleaded guilty, it'd be extremely lenient. Because if I went not guilty, it was going to cost the Crown millions to get the paperwork in the court. It was, the amount of paperwork in this, this council grants falls was phenomenal. Right, absolutely phenomenal. They were delivering it to the court in, on forklift trucks, right? So he made it clear that he'd be lenient. So I pleaded guilty. <coughs> and um, he gave me eight weeks. So all I had to do was go back for two more weeks. And the police uh, stormed out of the court. They were absolutely furious. What was Pat Tate like? Pat was an a exuberant character, you know, uh, larger than life. You know, people got the wrong idea about him. They thought, oh, because he was big and that. Pat was never really a fighter. He wasn't a fighting man as such. But he'd just walk in a room and he'd scare you just by being in there. Do you know what I mean? The, the, uh, he had a big personality. And when he was in Chelmsford, I mean, he was, he was uh, on the steroids and that, you know. But a lot of them were in those days, you know. They'd go into prison and they'd do bodybuilding in prison, you know. And to be a good bodybuilder in those days, you had to take steroids, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but he was quite a character, yeah. Yeah, because a lot of people were f feared of him. I don't know if that's the reputation from the books and films and all <laughs> that, but do you think it was a maybe blown out of proportion a bit? No, Pat, I'll tell you what, Pat was the type of bloke. You could probably beat him in a fight, right? a fist fight, right? But he'd come back and shoot you. You know, he was that type of bloke. He was, especially years later, as he, he, he got involved in drugs, he was doing a lot of drugs and that. You know, the last time I see him alive, I drove up a road called the Ridgeway, where I live in Chalkwell, and he was coming the other way in a, a 928 Porsche with the number plate on at that angle, right? I mean, any police car is going to say, you know, I don't know where, where this 928 had come from. And he flashed his lights at me to say hello. And I sort of waved to say hello and just looked and the rear number plate was on at that angle. <laughs> and I thought, what is, he, what is he doing? You know what I mean? Yeah, drawn attention. I don't know if the car was a ringer or, or whatever, but he'd obviously put the plates on while he was off his nut. Yeah. You know? So you've got out for that eight weeks. You've no warrants. What's the plans then? Uh, crikey, what did I do at that time? Oh yeah, I ended up buying a share in the pub. You know the Elms Pub in Lee? Yeah. Yeah, I bought a third share of the Elms Pub. I went into the business and uh, we filled it up actually. We had it taking a lot of money, that place. How do you end up getting a busy pub? How do you turn that into a success? Well, uh, we, Is that we, 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 we Yeah, definitely. We, when, when we took it over, it was closed down. Um, I think two, two managers in there, one had been stabbed and one had had a glass in his face or something. And the brewery that owned it had shut it down. Um, we went in there and took it over and all the people that were likely to do those type of things, they all knew us. And there was three of us involved, like me and two mates. And um, suddenly in the pub, we, ju we just got it really busy again. You know, we were taking about, how much were we taking roughly in the Elms? Around about 12 grand a week. Now this is 1993 by this time. You know, it was a lot of money in, in, in those days, you know. Um, every week I was walking out of there with, with about 1,200 pound clear every week. So, what so it was fantastic. doing with your money? Like you always seem to make money, but you never ever seem to <sighs> get right ahead yeah, where no, you no, are comfortable. True. Yeah. Um, we all spend I just party. always live well. I bought nice cars. Um, always had boats around me, speed boats and that. Um, you know, I'd buy the occasional aeroplane, <laughs> like, which is true. Yeah. You know, and it, it, you, you manage. And then obviously like, we used to party a lot. My my wife, used to, his mum, used to take a fair, fair few bob off of me as well. You know, it, it, the money just goes, right? I never, even in those days, I saved money when I was doing the runs in Tenerife and that. I did save. 
But back in England, even in those days, sort of pulling in twelve, thirteen hundred pound a week, um, I never really saved anything. Just know. living a fast life. Yeah, just the money would just go. You know, by the time you 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 paid, up, we were renting a bungalow. Um, my wife, uh, we had the kids to feed, the clove, you know, your own clothes. Then you buy a nice car, you had to run it. Then you'd be out partying certain nights. You know, the money just went. Mm -hmm. So you've yeah. got the pub, you're making a bit of dough again. Yeah. And then obviously you've, you've, you've went to the dark side again when you started to make a cross. What kind of drugs were you doing then? No, I never, uh, I, I wasn't doing any drugs at that time. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't smuggling anything at that time. No, when, not at all. When, what did you do after the pub? Well, what happened was the police basically said that the pub was being filled with East London gangsters and we were gangsters and that, and they, and they, they stopped and like the brewery basically took the pub off us, you know? Um, so there was some truth in what they say, but only some truth, you know? We, we used to have a lot of people come down and that, a lot of people from Canning Town, that, that sort of area. And, um, Quite a few of the local, what you'd call villains, uh, used to drink in our pub and that, you know. But uh, there was never any trouble, never any police call outs or anything, but they, they just objected to it, you know. Yeah, like you see, it's, it's hard to get away from that life if you've got all the top villains coming round the pub, having a drink, talking about the next turn, the next robbery, the next bit of gear. That, is that what you found it hard to distance yourself from these people? Yeah, definitely. It wasn't just me, though. I mean, it was uh, at the time there was me, um, I mean, my associates at the time, Johnny Moody, Colin Ball and that. We all knew loads and loads of people in that field, you know. Um, I wasn't involved in any crime at that time. You know, I just had the money from the pub coming in and that. But uh, there was always, you know, people come in and suddenly splashing money around and rumour had it they'd done an armed robbery or something. You know, there was that they used to go on. Mm -hmm. You know, what did you do after the pub? <laughs> uh, God, yeah. seeing that we ran about '93. Yeah, when they shut the pub down and that, we went into debt collecting. Just being a muscle. Uh, yeah, me, Colin Ball, and John Moody. Who are um, they two? Yeah, they were two very handy fellas. Both of them. John John Moody was a boxer. Don't you know who heard of John? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he boxed for the British light heavyweight tower, and that was a good puncher, John. Colin was tough and that, and we went into uh, debt collecting. And it weren't long before we were under arrest. The, all three of us were all under arrest for uh, extortion. What sort of debt were you collecting? How much? Uh, most of the debts were around between ten and 30,000. How much were you getting off at 20%, half of it? Well, we, we, we varied it. I mean, one debt I remember we went after was, was 30 grand, and uh, we were taking 10 out of it. 10,000 out of it and, and returning 20 to the, you know, the person that was owed. Um, and if the av average debt, say, of, of 10,000, we'd probably take nearly half of that. You know, we want half of that to get it back. Because the people that, the, the, the way people looked at it was, we might as well give them half and get half because we ain't going to get anything otherwise, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we all got arrested for extortion and um, placed on remand, and that really broke it all up, you know. We were all on remand for about six months. What sort of strategies would you use to get your money back? Well, I'd go in and talk to them and say, let it explain the situation, while John and Colin used to stand there sort of growl at them a bit. And, um, you know, they could tell just by the, the atmosphere, the, the vibes that we were giving off, that we, you know, we weren't going to take no for an answer. And... Um, we didn't really have to threaten anyone, you know. Uh, but on one of the occasions, one of the one of the boys got carried away and uh, pulled a bloke out of his seat and broke his ribs with a couple of punches. And uh, he went to the police, this guy, and we ended up on remand for uh, six months we was on remand. Did you get sentenced for that? No, no, no. They, all charges were dropped, you know. That's what happens, isn't it? Like... Yeah, it, it, it was... It was uh, all they had was this guy's words, you know, and we, we made a no comment interview all the way through and uh, they dropped the charges. So what did you do when you came out of prison then? Uh, 94, 94. 
I started to go back into the property business again. I thought the top property game was going to make a turn, actually. I sold my place in Tenerife um, and came out of it with just enough money to get back in buying property again. See the houses that you had in the 80s? Did yeah. you sell them off as well when the property went from 50 grand to 15? Uh, it, the money I, got that, caught, I got caught with about three of them, but the other ones I'd sold and, and made good money on. Yeah, because proceeds of crime and that wasn't out then at all. The two thousand. No, yeah, there was no proceeds of crime in those days. But all the all the money I made in the eighties on my properties and that there was no really no crime involved. You know, mm -hmm. um, I was later charged with a few council grants frauds, but even they were questionable. You know, I plead, I plead like I told you, I pleaded guilty at court over because the judge said it had saved the crown a lot of money, um, and I pleaded guilty. But basically. You know, it was very, they were very tenuous charges, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you try to get into the property market again, how did that go? Yeah, it was okay. Suddenly after, I think it was Tony Blair got in, 97, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Suddenly the market started picking up again. And, um, you know, I started buying a few houses, doing them up and, and making a few bob. How could you, not, like you, all the stories either, doing well, money, prison, yeah. legit, back being dodgy, legit. Yeah. losing it gaining it back that like, it was always a roller coaster you lived that very fast paced no, life definitely like. definitely a roller coaster yeah no matter no matter what i did or what i seemed to earn right i always seemed to end up virtually skinned again and then or, or get involved in crime again and then sort of sitting down and thinking right i've got to sort myself out and, and starting again you know how many this time many times did you sit with that conversation with yourself well probably about four or five times through the course of my life you know where i'd actually made a lot of money i mean back in the late 90s again i started making good i remember one house i bought i paid forty six thousand for it I only spent about five doing it up. It was a big five bed house. Um, and I sold it for 126, you know, so I was, I was suddenly making good money again, you know, mm -hmm. uh, another flat I bought down by the, on South End seafront. I paid 65 for it, rented it out for about 18 months and sold it for 160, you know, so I was getting good money coming back in. Yeah. You're making more than money. You, you seem to make more money when you're legit. Yeah, that's, that's true, actually. Yeah, it probably is true. Yeah. But the trouble is with, with, the, with the business I was in, especially with property, you could make it legit, but somehow or another, it was all peaks and troughs in those days, right? Somehow or another, things would go wrong and, it, and suddenly you'd be back skinned again, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, what happened with actually, with the money I made in the late 90s, I went on the stock market, uh, working on the stock market, like with the, you know, in the dot-com bubble. Yeah. And I got stung in that, you know. I made, um, in around about 10 weeks, I made about 700 grand. And in the space of about three weeks when the bubble burst, I lost nearly all of it. <laughs> you know, it's the story of my life. And that is uh -huh. the truth. I mean, I'll tell you one company I bought. I remember a company I was given a tip called Infobank. And I bought 20,000 quids worth at a pound. Um, sold them at a fiver. Right, so you say, great, you know, you've earned 100 grand. They went to 42 quid, right? If I'd have stayed in there, half a million, I'd have made about 800 grand, mm -hmm. you know. So once again, I sold too early, but I still made a good money of them. Um, and I bought uh, quite a few other shares that I made good money, but when the bubble burst, everybody got stung, you know, everyone yeah. went down in that. But you've got the mindset to make, though, you've always had, you've always earned that. Yeah. It's just, Keeping yeah. that, what was the fucking problem? Keep, eh? Keeping it was was a was a big problem. Yeah, definitely. And I'd always, not only that, instead of getting earning a lot of money and say, right, I'll sit on that, I'll live well on that. It was always, what can I use that money for? And then that money would either make money or again would blow out big time. Mm -hmm. You know. So did you get used a lot, Sydney, when you're making do a good guy like you seem used. a good guy? Yeah. No, 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 I wasn't used. No, definitely not. But no. a lot of people who's making dough, you get a lot of leeches in that life where... No, I, I don't think you call them leeches. I, I had good friends that I used to look after, but a, a lot of uh, my friends, like when I was in the bed and breakfast game and that, they actually worked for me. And um, as well as I looked after them, at the same token, they worked as well, you know. Yeah, and so they were good, they were great friends. Because mm -hmm. a lot of 
criminals and that I speak to back in the day when they've got everything, they've got so many people around them, but when they end up with fuck all, there's nobody around. Yeah, well, that's true. They're just good time guys, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You know, um, no, no, most of my friends, I mean, I've got friends that I had when I was 12 years old that are still friends to this day, you know. Um, and when I was making a lot of money in the mid 80s, the friends that I had around me usually worked for me in some way or another. And, um, you know, they, they were well looked after, but at the same time, they looked after me as well, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so it worked both ways. Yeah, definitely. It's not a one-way street where people are just hanging off, hanging no, off. No, 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 no. I mean, I wouldn't stand for that. Yeah. You know? yeah. So you've got the bubble. You've, you're have you making dough on the stock market. The crash happens again. Very, yeah. very fast money. Even yeah. now with kids with Bitcoin, this and that, that everybody thinks they're a genius with the stock market, but you ain't in control no. when it, like you no, say, no, the no, bubble's no. going to bust. I mean, it's bust. an old saying, a, a little knowledge is, is can be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And everybody, as far as the stock market's concerned, the same as politics, you've only got a little knowledge about it. And a little knowledge, if you convince yourself that you're a genius at it, then you're fucking mad, you know? Yeah. It's like people used to say to me, they'd know a share, like I just mentioned Infobank just now, right? Oh yeah, I bought them at a pound and sold them at 40. Never, never mm -hmm. in a million years, because they don't go from a pound straight to 40, right? They go up to five quid, then they drop back to three quid. And anybody like me, for instance, when they went to five times the value, you sell. Because you don't know they're going to go to 40 pound, you know? Mm. So when anyone says, says to you, oh, I bought them at a pound, I sold them at 40, they've got to be joking, you know? No one does that. Yeah, it's a gamble. Same with Bitcoin. I think that'll be up to like 72, 76 grand. Is that what it went to? Yeah, the most, I mean, the most I heard it was 45,000. It's down to the 20s now. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, it's volatile, isn't it? Yeah, so people did make a lot of money from it, but the bubble's busting that, I think. Yeah, yeah, I don't know yeah. too much about it, because I used to be a gambler. So for me, that's still all gambling. There's never a sure thing. No, well, I mean, what I learned with the stock market, right, was was volatile stocks, right, can often be big earners, but they can be very big losers. You're better off keeping to the solid blue chip stock, and just going on small movements, you know, mm -hmm. which is what I do now quite a lot. You know, I just, uh, I'll buy like say 100 grand's worth of Lloyds at 42p and get out at 44. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I nick 5%, but 5% is five grand. Yeah, That's not bad for a day's work, is it? Yeah, I was speaking to someone who does that. He invests his money into Coca-Cola. Yeah. The share has always risen, he says. He'll do the same as you make yeah, it. Yeah, well, Coke, Coke on the American market last time I see it was about, I think it was about $170 a share or something, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, but I'll tell you what I'm good at, giving other people tips, not being on myself, and those tips actually come into fruition. <laughs> I, 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 seriously, I, someone asked me, it was about two years ago, what do you reckon on the market at the moment, Sid? And I went, I'll tell you what, the best buy on there at the moment is on the American market, Goldman Sachs. Right, and they were $170 a share at the time, or $180 a share. And I weren't on them, you know, I had my money wrapped up in England. Uh, this geezer went and bought a load of them, and they went up to $390. He never even gave me a drink out of it. You know, <laughs> when I said to him, like, You owe me at least 10 grand out of that, he went, Sid, would you have covered the losses? I went, No. It's a like, fair point. Yeah. And I went, no, I said, listen, in good faith, you, you keep your money, you know mm. what I mean? So what did you do after then? The stock well, that was when I then got involved in the, the big stuff like flying cocaine and that in after um, flying cocaine in what I got the 20, 25 years for. What did you, what was your first shipment? Uh, the first shipment was a trial run with just two kilos, believe it or not. <laughs> I had... Uh, See, what it was, you, the, the, the main, obviously it goes without saying, the main time you get nicked when you're smuggling using airplanes is loading it up at one end, i.e. on the continent, or unloading at this end. They're the two vulnerable points. Well, I could get round that because I could, I could go to an airfield that we, we uh, later got pointed point out was like, like a private airfield in, in France, right? And I could land in England at a place uh, in Kent that was absolutely kosher. Well, I can't name you the name of the places because they're still operating and the people people that are on there were actually 
working with me. So I can't name it the places. Um, but to test it out, I flew into France, uh, was given two kilos, and I landed at the place in Kent, and the bloke turned up, collected the two kilos, and went, yeah, it's perfect. So that was the first one I done was just two kilos, which normally is not worth starting the plane up for, because um, I used to get paid £3,000 a kilo for transport. Right, so on a, on a normal load, I would move between 10 and uh, 20 kilos. So how much were they paying a kilo? Uh, in Holland at the time, I believe it was 20,000 euros a kilo. Right. Still expensive, huh? Still expensive, but in England it was 36, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think a lot of actually know, first of all, it was around about 32, right? So they'd make 10,000. But out of that 10,000, they'd have to pay me 3,000 for flying it in. So if I flew a nice little afternoon's work for me, it would be, say, uh, 15 kilos, uh, 45 grand for two hours' work. Now, that's pretty good money, isn't it? Yeah. Right. So I, I would do that, and, um, you know, everything was sweet. It was, it, was, it was easy money. How long would the flight be? My record, too, my record to the, we had this field sorted out in northern France, right? My record, coming back from there once, I did northern France into, I had an airfield by uh, Harwich, right? Just near Harwich, a place, place called Great Oakley. Um, I'd done it once in 26 minutes. On the ground in France, in the air, and back on the ground at uh, Harwich in 26 minutes. What speed do you go? That was on a tailwind that day. I was lucky. I was, my plane used to do about 170 mile an hour and I had a tailwind of about 30 mile an hour. So I was doing about 200 mile an hour. So you could be up down, get a shipment and back in half an hour? Oh, that quick, yeah. I mean, the, 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 when, when I got sentenced at court, like, they actually found my sat nav, which I never used to normally use, but I did on this one occasion because the weather was so bad, right? They found that I'd landed the plane right, was on the ground and back out in the air in 26 seconds. So I've landed the plane, I've loaded, I've got the coke on board and I'm back in the air in 26 seconds. So they've just threw it and you've fucked off again. Do Literally, you... I would land, right, come in uh, to, the, to the airfield, right, land like that, right, and as it run down like that, the bloke would be waiting at the end with a bag I'd spin the plane round like that, the, the hatch would open, the bag would go in, and I'd turn round and was back in the air in 26 seconds. That's fast. Yeah, it's that, that's how quick I, I could do it. Were you ever sent out to anywhere further? No, no, no. I just stayed in totally in uh, northern France and southern Belgium. Yeah. Yeah, it was an, uh, uh, I never, never had to go any further because it was coming down from Amsterdam. See the sat nav, is that? In the on the plane? No, the sat nav was I bought was a separate entity totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I never ever ever used it for obvious reasons. Yeah, of course. It, it recalls where you've been and what you've been doing. But this one occasion, the occasion I got caught, the the weather was that bad. Right, I had to go up above the clouds, come back into England, and the only way I could know where I was was with the sat nav, and that's what they got me on. How do you fly on? Can you fly under the radar? Is that possible to do? Yeah, you can go down low by the sea, um, but you attract a bit of attention because there's a lot of container shipping goes up and down there, and they get on the radio and they inform the police. You know, they, they don't think they're not taking any notice of you. They're, the container ships and that, they're on a reward of five hundred pound for every drugs run they turn in. Um, so what I used to like to do personally was I'd go in amongst the clouds and uh, I'd, I'd go over there, just drop below the clouds so I knew I had my trajectory right, where I was heading, and then just stay in, in the base of the clouds so I couldn't be seen. You know? What if it's a summer's day, no clouds? What's that? If there's no clouds? If it's summer's day, then I'd, I'd just take the chance and just go up. I used to go up quite high, about 10,000 feet. And... Um, you know, I'd take the chance. 
Was there radios or anything? Did anybody ever radio in to ask you who you were? No, you're meant to have a, a, a what they call a transponder, right? Which let, which gives you your you identity of your plane and your position, right? It sends out a signal, but obviously I used to turn turn mine off, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I used to the the only time once actually I came back across from France to Dover, and the uh, Coast Guard's plane came right over to me, and actually had a look in the plane, seriously. Oh, so the Coast Guards have got a plane as well? Yeah, it's I always uh, thought silver just... with a red nose it is. I just oh. thought they had boats. No, they've got a plane, they've got a spotter plane up there as well. Yeah, I've never seen that. But it works, it <sighs> doesn't go much further north than, you know, Broadstairs? Yeah. Yeah, it goes about level with Broadstairs and stays there. But what I used to do, I used to come down from North Essex and come down the, the coast roughly to about Malden and then go into uh, southern Belgium. Mm-hmm. That way. What was the buzz like when well, they're looking at you? Oh, it was amazing, mate. I tell you, I, I used to, like, some of the storms I went through were unbelievable. One particular storm, I mean, that weren't a nice buzz, that was fear. Mm -hmm. You know, I was caught, you know, like you see these films where people in a plane getting swept about. This was worse than anything <laughs> you can imagine. <clears throat> and um, the bloke I had with me, actually, when I actually pulled out of the storm, after about 10 minutes of it, 15 minutes of being caught, where I couldn't, it was that bad, I couldn't even see the propeller of the plane. I was flying solely on instruments. <clears throat> when I actually pulled out about 10, 12,000 feet up, I turned to the bloke in the plane with me and he'd actually frozen with fear. He was actually frozen. His nervous system had packed up. And uh, it took him about half an hour to get back to normal, you know. Was there many people doing the flying? Not just yourself, but other people who are flying planes, getting gear and bringing it back. I know no, people used to do the. I don't think many were doing it. Yeah, I know people no. used to do the boats and the, the vans. I think one, one or two of them from the local clubs used to do uh, tobacco runs now and again. You know, they bring back some gold Virginia or old Alban. Um, but actually, flying the drugs in in planes was quite rare, to my knowledge. See, when you were dropping the drugs back, did you? Was there somebody always waiting? Did you always have the heads up that everything was clear? To yeah, land? Well, what happened was, was when I when I, I used to land, I mean, at one time I used to come into uh, a field in Kent, like I told you about. We had a field sorted out in Kent. Um, everything was all right, okay? But the, the, when I couldn't land there, sometimes I'd take the risk of going at South End, which was dangerous, hey. really. Well, because you, I, I could land there and I could have customs men on me. And it actually happened one night. I landed back, back there and I had certain stuff on board and they run at me from all angles. But I just spun the plane around, took off the wrong way up the airport and shot up, oh, got away, you know. Um, they thought I had cocaine and that on board. I mean, I'm not at liberty to say what I had on board, right? But it wasn't cocaine. But at the same time, I, I, I just thought they were gonna hijack me. That's what I said to them, you know, when I I'd later landed, and they questioned me, you know, I said, well, I saw four blokes running at the plane, you know. Mm -hmm. And they went, well, you must have known it was customs, man. I went, no, I didn't, you know. Yeah, so uh, as long as they can't catch you. See, if you're on a plane and you've got the, <clears throat> like the guards, the coast guards on another plane, like, could you have dropped stuff out the window if, if need be? Or was that too much of a Well, risk? you couldn't, yeah, you could, if, if they were on you like that and they were flying next to you, you know, you, you couldn't do that then, you'd be in trouble. Um, but uh, all you just do is, when if at like the time the, the Coast Guards flew right up next to me, I just sat normal. They flew with me for about five minutes, then just shut off. I just assumed that everything was all right, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other way was you'd look for a bank of clouds and fly into the clouds, you know. And they can't see you? No, no, no one can see you. Even no. on the radar? They could from radar from the ground, but not, they ain't got radar on the plane. Mm-hmm. You know, so they wouldn't, the blokes in the plane wouldn't know where you were. So see, when flights are taking off, have you got to register call logs if you're going through the books and flight logs to tell you when you're flying out, when you're flying in? Yeah, well, when you when you take a plane abroad, um, you have to report to EFRO. You, you, you log what you call a flight plan. Um, and it's basically what time you're taking off, where you're taking off from, um, what height you're flying at, and you have a transponder on the plane that sends out a signal to let them know where you are. 
Um, and then obviously you tell them where you're going to land when you when you do go abroad, you know. Um, well, I just used to ignore all of that. How many runs did the corporal say you done? Um, well, they only had evidence of one run. That was the run I got caught on. That was the run that uh, got you 25 years? You know, I ain't going to... Um, allegedly, I did a sort of 20, 25 runs, but that's just allegedly, you mm. know. It only takes one to... Yeah, 25, I mean, they were saying roughly 25 runs at roughly 30,000 a time. I don't know what that works out to, about 750 grand, is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I estimate that I had out of it in total. Um, and who am I to argue, you know? Over what period of time? That was between 206 and 208. What the before the, the day before you get caught your last run, but what's going yeah. through your mind? Did everything feel as normal? No, it, the, the the day before my last run, I got caught. Um, I mean, I always told the people over there that I never work on a Monday. Right, Monday is is a day that you just don't want to go near. Nobody, not even bank robbers, rob a bank on a Monday. Right, your lucky days to work are always Thursday and Friday. Right, it's a strange thing, but it's it's true. Right. However, they phoned me on the Monday morning. I said I'd go out and see how the day felt. Well, I always used to go out before I'd do a run. I'd actually go out and just see how the day felt to me. Just just draw in the feelings from what's, what's going on around me, you know. Um, and that day, everything felt wrong. And I got back to my flat. It was around about 10 o'clock in the morning. And, I, and straight away, Amsterdam phoned me on the basher. So I've... I've answered the phone and uh i said look i ain't on it ain't happening they said to me the contact over there said to me look the guy's down in france he's sitting on 12 kilos and he's panicking right they, they had a new courier or something that had taken it down from amsterdam down to the, to the airfield uh and in in a nutshell i said well look, i'll tell you what i'll do i'll go up and take the plane up i'll fly down the english channel and see how it feels Right, and then I'll let you know. So, which is what I did. I left my house about quarter past 10, drove up to the airfield at Harwich, got in the plane, took the plane down the English Channel, and it all felt wrong. The weather was bad, the clouds were low, it was a Monday, everything was wrong. And I said, look, I ain't doing it, you know, but they begged me on the phone that this bloke down on the ground, who's got the 12 kilos, is panicking. Uh, and so I, I, I went and did it. Where did you get caught? Well, what happened was, again, because the weather was bad, something I never, ever did, I put the sat-nav on. I, I had to because the cloud was so low to find the airfield. So I put the sat-nav on, landed in France, picked up the parcel, then I'm back in the air again. And again, the cloud was, the cloud was at around about three, 400 feet. It was a horrible day. I went up through the clouds into the blue skies and came back using the sat nav over Harwich. Um, and, and again, normally I would drop, do a drop to, to my man on the edge of a forest. There was a forest in Suffolk where I used to do a drop. I would drop from about 1,200 feet. So even if you were below walking your dog, you're never going to see it, right? And I'd have the engine down on tick over and I used to glide in with 20 degrees of flap on the plane, right? So you wouldn't hear an engine, you'd hear nothing. This day, the cloud was that low, I had to come in below the cloud to see where I was gonna do the drop, right? So everything was wrong. Done the drop and was spotted by a woman walking her dog. Uh, now in, you know, years gone by, she'd have had to walk three or four miles to a phone box. By that time, you're all gone. These days with mobile phones, they're on you straight away. She phoned the police. The police then caught the bloke on the ground. Um, there was two of them down there. One drove off with 10 kilos to London in a four before they reckoned it was spotted there. And the bloke who got caught with me had two kilos and seven firearms, seven uh, Czechoslovakian semi-automatics. And that was it, you know, we were caught. They, all they did then was, this woman said it was a blue plane, right? 
they phoned round different airfields in the area and found out that I'd took my plane up and they got me. Just from that, so there was, it was only her statement that caught you? Absolutely. But why, how, how is that enough? To Well, because I'll tell you why, because I, I would have actually got away with it because I'd have said, well, listen, there's loads of blue planes. You can't say that it was just because I'm up in my plane, but they got the sat-nav. Oh, fuck, yeah. Right? Yeah. The fucking sat-nav. Do you know what? I paid £2,000 for this sat-nav, right, from a flight shop up in Victoria, right? And I only bought it for emergencies, right? Not when I'm doing a run. It was if I was up in my plane, I got caught in a storm, right? Couldn't come down low so I could know where I was. That's the only reason I bought it. But because the weather was that bad this day, I used it. When the police unraveled it, they got that I landed where, exactly where I landed in France. I was on the ground for 26 seconds, right? And they went, how can a man land a plane? The judge went, how can a man land a plane, pick up um, 12 kilos of cocaine and be back in the air in 26 seconds? And I went, well, this man did it. And the judge went, well, he must be, this ain't the first time he's done it. So when the judge sentenced me, Although they could only prove that I'd done it once with the evidence, he knew, didn't he? He's not stupid, is he? Mm -hmm. So it was basically your own mistake that got you 25 years as well? It was, I'll tell you what it was. It was, it was my mistake for going over there because I should have stuck by my guns and said, listen, I don't care what you say about this man panicking there. Now, I'm not going, right? But. They kept, in, not kept insisting, they kept saying to me, look, please go because he's down there, he's panicking. And I went, you know. So it's not as if you had fingerprints or anything on any gear or guns? No, nothing. I never touched the stuff. When I pulled the plane, when I used to pull the plane alongside, when the bloke dropped the bag in, I wouldn't even look in it in case a hair or DNA went in there, mm -hmm. right? He used to drop the bag in the plane and I'd have a person in the plane with me that would do the drop. So you're thinking you've got the perfect turn. Basically, you, you can't really get caught. With, if you've done everything by the book that like no. you normally do like, no. because if you're dropping it from a plane if that witness is saying I seen a blue pl plane it doesn't really mean fuck all it can't really stick in no, court no, no. where I used to always drop from to around about 1200 feet right you would never see the plane mm -hmm. if you look at one of those planes I mean mine was a four seater my plane was probably about I don't know 15 foot long right you can't see it at, at 1200 feet you know I was always safe but it was this one fucking day that everything came together and went wrong. Mm -hmm. The one day I used the sat nav, right? You know, it was, it was, uh, it's just the way it was. How did you know when to drop it off? Was there a certain target on it? No, I'd, I'd, I'd have the, the bloke on the phone from Amsterdam talking to me and the geezer on the ground talking to him. So he'd be on one phone talking to him going, yeah, they're right above me right now. And he'd go to me, drop it. <laughs> it was that easy, right? So you get a call going from the ground in Suffolk to Amsterdam, Amsterdam back to my aeroplane, and then me doing the drop. So it's just a case of somebody on the phone telling you to drop it? Yeah. Is it a hatch on the on the plane or is it out the window? No, we used to have a, my, my plane was a, uh, a Piper Cherokee and the door, it, it was a door and window in one. So you used to just lift it up like that it was a low wing, right? And just dropped the bag straight off the, the side of the wing. So it's not as if you've got the heads up that somebody's getting caught or else you'd have got rid of the sat nav, you'd have made them get rid of the plane. Like yeah. They've just came to you. What are you thinking when they come well, calling? Well, no, what happened was I, I, I obviously drove home quite safe. I mean, I landed the plane at the airfield at Great Oakley, put it in the hangar. I then drove home, had a nice breakfast on the way home at the Little Chef down the A12, right? drove home and thought everything was kosher. I got a call from Amsterdam. Don't know, I, I ditched the, what happened? I ditched the mobile, obviously. The mobile that I land before I land, it actually goes in the sea. But it must have been another number he knew to contact me on, right? Which was unusual. So he's phoned me from Amsterdam and gone, the geezer on the ground has not arrived. I said, what's he do? Well, I said, well, he's done a runner with your stuff because I dropped the gear out to him, right? He went, there's something gone wrong. He hasn't arrived. And that's when I knew that something was up. Um, 
but I, I, I thought, I don't see how they could get me. Because, like, you know, I, I didn't bargain on this woman with a blue plane and all the rest of it. So I never, I left the, the, the sat nav was in my car and I left it. I mean, I should have moved it. But, you know, I didn't. So you would have got away with it if you had no sat nav? If there was no sat nav there, they would have, they couldn't have charged me. Yeah, because anybody could have been driving that plane. Or... The, well, the, the, the Crown, the CPS would have said to them, you haven't got enough evidence. You know, they wouldn't have allowed them to proceed. It was the sat nav that sunk me. Do you think you would have ever been caught if you never got caught that day? I'll tell you what, and I mean this, right? If In a way, it was a godsend that I got caught because I was going to die at some stage. The two, two particular storms I went through in those two years were absolutely horrific. I mean, one of them was worse than anything you see in a film, right? And I came out below this, I thought, I'll, I'll come down and see where I am. Right? I knew I was near Calais. Right, I was north of Calais, probably Dunkirk way, right? And I came down below the clouds and I missed the sea, right? The wave, because the, the, the air pressure had changed, right? My altimeter had chat was in, inaccurate because of the air pressure. I came out and missed the waves of the sea by about 10 foot. And I mean, I'd have just got under and been dead. Um, and there was another person in the plane with me would have died with me as well. It was, I was taking chances that were a joke, you know. Anyone going into the weather I was going into would have gone, do you know what, I'm not doing this, and turned the plane round. I was thinking, fuck it, let's have a go. Is that the buzz? That's part of the buzz, mm -hmm. yeah. It was the, I remember once flying over on, on, a, on a mission. I still remember it was on a Saturday afternoon, right? And as I flew over, I had actually gone further south than I should have done. And I tell you, the reason I did was because there were so many planes up there at the time, I knew I could get lost in them, right? So I went down south, probably around, you know, Sandwich in Kent, yeah. right? About level with there, going over towards France. Mm -hmm. And as we were going over, it went, uh, turn, turn the planes around, anyone going over to France, there's high winds, right? And I thought, oh, you know, and it again, warning of high winds. And I looked across at me and I saw about 10 different planes all turn round and go, start going back. I thought, fuck it, let's go. I just went for it, right? <laughs> I was going down to a place called Latuke to land. Well, I'll tell you what, I got buffeted. This wind that hit me was just unbelievable. I don't know where it came. It must have come from Siberia or somewhere. It buffeted the plane and threw me around. And I had to literally struggle with the controls for about three or four minutes to regain control. It was it was a, a real blast. It was, I don't know what it was, how this wind came up, but it, it did. So what are you thinking then when the corpus come calling? Well, I mean, what happened was I found out from a guy when I was in Chelmsford prison, because he, he came up to me and said, I walked past your house the night you were arrested. They blocked the roads off and had all armed police all the way down because of the seven firearms and that. So they assumed that I had a firearm in there. Um, it was one o'clock in the morning on the Tuesday morning by this time. And there was a bang, bang, bang on the door and the door came in. So you know, didn't you? You know, I walked out to the living, living room and I just went like this, hands up. And there was about three marksmen on me with their guns. Uh, took me out the flat laid me down in the middle of the road, believe it or not, um, and just held a gun to my head and said, don't move, you know, and obviously, but not quite on my head, it was about a foot above my head. And I went, don't worry, mate, I'm not, you know. Uh, and they carted me off, you know. What are you thinking when you go to court? You must be thinking, I've got a chance of getting away with this. Well, see, the, 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 the sat nav I bought, Oh, that was the reason I didn't know the sat-nav. When you switch the sat-nav off, it was meant to wipe out any previous history of, the, of what, what you'd done. And I made sure that I'd turned the sat-nav off, right? But what they did was they sent it over to some boffin, right? <laughs> this boffin was obviously really good with sat-navs and that. And he worked out that I'd gone to France, was on the ground for the 26 seconds, picked the... So the... the 
really the sat nav had grasped me up. Um, and up until then, I, I didn't realize, until they got the police report back saying that they'd worked the sat nav out, I thought I was going to get off it, yeah. Even, it's mad, the technology, even, I know a lot of friends and that, I know a lot of people are in prison with the encro phones and they think they can talk the way they want to talk. Yeah. If it's technology, man, there's always a way around it to find the data, to I find know. the information. Like, and you're talking, what, early 2000s? Um, this was 2008. The technology now, like, it's, it's mad. And So you're thinking in, you're getting a chance. When did they start releasing the evidence that they had? Well, they took me to call um, the, in, uh, to get further remand because obviously I was remanded in custody. Over a for, year. For, um, I was over, I was, no, I, they arrested me in the February and um, I ended up actually pleading guilty at court. I think it was in the July. And then they didn't sentence me. They, they sentenced me in the September, I think it was. Yeah, that's uh, pretty a fast case for the turnaround from February. Yeah, because I pleaded pled. guilty. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I pleaded guilty and the judge, I knew the judge really had it in for me. So a week before the trial, before I was going to be sentenced, and I actually, I was ill. I did feel really ill. Um, I said, I can't go to court. Well, I was trying to get the judge moved on to get a better judge, right? But he weren't having it. He was he was involved in a fraud trial in Swindon. He stopped the trial to come back to Chelmsford to sentence me. So when, when a judge does that, you know you're in trouble, right? Believe me, when, when a judge is on another trial, right, across the other side of the country, he stops that trial just to drive back to sentence you, you know you're in trouble. And I was thinking to, me, thinking to myself, well, I'll probably end up with about 12 or 13 years, you know? Um, and then, of course, he gives me 25, but he had to knock a third off because I pleaded guilty. You know, and he actually didn't knock a third, he knocked 30% off. Um, and I walked out of the court with 17 years. Take some balls to plead to a case where you know you're going to get a life for that. How much did you battle with that not to take it through trial? Well, I'll be honest with, with once the once they'd unraveled the sat nav, there was, I had no chance at trial. You know, if they if it hadn't been for the sat nav, I'd have gone to trial, you know. Um, and probably won the case. Um, but let's face it, I was guilty. Um, the police had done their own work. The police had gone to this specialist who somehow, I don't know how he'd done it, but he, he managed to, because that sat nav was meant to wipe out all records when you use it. And I remember talking to the bloke at the shop. He said, once you switch it, switch it off, it's scrubbed. But he managed to track it. So what are you thinking when you get a 17? Well, I walked down the stairs. I mean, it's like getting punched in the belly, really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But in a, in a funny sort of way, right, I was actually relieved because right up until then, I didn't know what I was going to get. When you know what you've got and you've got to get on with it and do it, you feel a lot better. Um, although I, was, I, I wasn't expecting 17 years. What did you get charged with? Um... Well, illegal importation, smuggling, illegal importation of uh, Class A drugs and firearms. It's probably the highest as well. It's not just a case of drugs and it firearms. The, I'll be honest, it was the firearms that done me. Mm -hmm. if, if, I, if it had just been the cocaine on the guilty plea, I'd have got about eight years. Right, that's a standard tariff. Because you've got to remember, they only managed to re recover two kilos. <clears throat> but the guy that was on the trial with me, he turned QE, right? Did he turned a snitch? Yeah, he turned snitch. He, uh, the guy that got caught with, with the whole package only got seven years. I got caught with nothing and I got 17. But did he turn against you as well? No, he never turned against me, but he didn't have to because they had me anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he didn't know me from Adam. He'd never met me before. Um, but he, he, I'll tell you, he did do. He fingered one of the guys in, in Amsterdam who he knew because that was the guy that put him on to go and pick it up. And the guy in Amsterdam got five years in a Dutch prison. Fuck. Down, sake, down to him. And, um, you know, it didn't take a, you didn't need a deer stalker and a pipe to work out who the one that was across. I got 17 years on a guilty plea. So what have I told them? Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing at all. And the other guy that gets caught with it gets seven years.
You seem to be a man of your word as well. Like you seem to fly straight if you're in that circle. I've you know, never, I've never, never crossed bend. anyone up in my life. You're never going to bend or break. But see, never. when you're pleading guilty as well, and somebody gets stuck in, does that then think, fuck, I hope they don't think it's me? Well, yeah, but the, the thing is, my sentence spoke volumes for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when I went to, when they moved me from Chelmsford, where I was, I was there for about 15 months, they moved me to a jail up in Nottingham with all major drug importers from Liverpool. I remember you interviewed Stevie Mee, didn't you? Yeah, Stevie. Well, Stevie Mee was one of my mates in yeah, there. Yeah, Stevie right? proper. He's a lovely bloke, yeah. Steve. Really quiet, lovely man. Mm -hmm. um, they put us all in the same wing together, right? And no one could look at my look at my sentence, 17 years on a guilty plea, and think that I'm a grass. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. If I was, if I was, for what I'd done, I was doing six years, then I'm a definite grass, but not with 17. What's the first night when your door's banged up and you're getting, you've got a 17? Well, you got to remember, I was already on remand for about eight months. Um, so I was used to being behind the door. Funny enough, in, in, a, in a funny sort of way, it was relief because you finally know it's like, when you haven't been sentenced, you don't know what hurdles you've got to jump, right? When you've been sentenced, you know it's a 17 year, although it's a big sentence, you know, it's, you, at least you know what it is. So it's a relief mm -hmm. um, on one hand. On the other hand, you think, hang on a minute, 17, is that right? You know? It's, <laughs> it's a big one. It was, a, yeah, on, I mean, you got to remember, I've on a guilty plea, so I had thirty percent knocked off of that. So my actual sentence was twenty-four years, you know. But the judge had to knock a third off. What were you, what were you category? A? You must have been category for a good while, you there. I was category A when I first went in, um, but after about three months, they dropped it straight away, fast. Yeah, I was I was dropped down. Um, I think it was the July. I was arrested in the February, and then I was. Uh, back down to B category, I think, in July. How many different prisons were you in? I went to, uh, I started off at Chelmsford, then I went to Loudon Grange uh, at Nottingham. Um, then I went to open a new prison at Thameside in South London. Uh, about 15 of us went there to basically show the screws how to run a prison. <laughs> that's, the, that's the gospel truth. You know the company Serco that run yeah. a lot of the prisons now? Mm -hmm. They wanted us to go down to show the screws what roughly what was what was done, what. Um, and that was easy. That was easy time. You know, I was unlocked all the time. And Gladden Grange was a great prison. And not great prison. I don't say it for the fact that it was it was easy. because um, all all the time you're away from your family, nothing's easy. But what it was, it was the type of prison that would help people rather than make them more bitter. Let me phrase it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, you had education classes, you had great access to the gym, you know, clean living. Um, then after Thameside, I went to uh, a prison called The Mount in uh, Hertfordshire. Um, that was quite a tough job, it weren't easy. How come? Just the, the, the conditions, it was quite security, um, conscious, um, he was in the cell a lot of the time. Um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the greatest the Knicks, mm -hmm. but the gov. Funny enough, the gov there. I got to know the governor because I ended up running the magazine in there. I was doing a lot of writing while I was in there, and uh, the governor was a very very decent man. Mm -hmm. What he do you really think was. of the prison system for like, the late seventies? Slot them out, no TV or fuck all to the prisons of 2010. Oh, you can't compare it. I mean, the, I mean, look, in, in Loudon Grange when I was there, I was in Loudon Grange for nearly four years, um, three and a half years. We had flat screen tellies. We had Sky, we, we used to pay for it out of our phone calls, right? We had Sky Telly, Sky Sports, all the big fights that were on at the weekend we used to watch. We had we were allowed our boxing gear in there. We used to take I used to take boxing classes on a Sunday morning in the snooker room, right? And we used to have sparring sessions, and you know, it, it weren't that bad, honestly. Then when we finished the boxing training, my mate used to sort it out with the op plate boys, and we'd have a whole tray of bacon 
So we'd have about half a dozen bacon sandwiches each and that, you know. Mm -hmm. How do you get through a sentence like that, Sydney? Like that? I'll tell you where you, how you get through. You get through it by laughing. You know, me and my mates, I mean, I can remember Christmas. I'll tell you it was Christmas 2011, sitting in my cell with some, uh, with a bottle of vodka, uh, a jug of orange, and four of us sitting there. It was me, a cocaine importer from North London, one of Pablo, the guy that used to work for Pablo Escobar's, his shipping agent years ago. Rogers? Right? No, it was a, a geezer, uh, we, we called him Dutchy. I can't remember his, his real name, but he, he was a Dutchman, but he was a shipping expert. You know, they used to move stuff from Bolivia and he would move it to, it's to spend in a dockyard in South Africa. And then from South Africa, it'd go to China. <laughs> and then in the end, by the time this, this container got into Europe, no one knew where the fuck it had come from, you know, where it came from Bolivia, it was full of cocaine. He was the shipping man for Escobar. And I remember sitting in my cell just laughing and drinking and laughing, you know, because it took your mind away from your sentence. Yeah, caged up. See, when you're all sitting together with importers and people bringing yeah. gear from all around the world, are you, in your mind, you're thinking we can work when we get out, or you're just thinking, fuck this No, life? We, you're forging friendships all the time, honestly. I mean... It never came to fruition, and thank God it hasn't, because I, I've, I've, I'm out of it all now completely. But when we used to sit in my cell and that, we used to talk about what we're going to do when we get out. We can, I can ship stuff to you. Sid, can you fly that down if we get this stuff? <laughs> I mean, at one time, they wanted me to land in this airstrip in Brazil, in the Brazilian jungle, right? Yeah. And fly from Venezuela into Brazil, where I'd be under the protection of the Brazilian police. And, and so on and so forth, you know. And it, it was all plans that you just made them at the time they were amusing, you know. Mm -hmm. But at that time, knowing your personality, you probably would have done it. I would have fucking done it, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my people, before I got nicked in Amsterdam, I'll tell you what they said to me, because what it was, look, these, the people that I work for, right, that actually had the cocaine, they're, they're the most, they, they, I would never meet them. Right? They would use a middleman who would meet the man that would meet me. And they, the cocaine used to go out all over Europe like that. They had buffers all the way down the line. So the people at the top, you never met them. But when I escaped from the customs, like I told you about earlier, where I escaped from the customs when they, when they run at me plane one night, when they found out that I'd done that, they went, can you ask this guy if he would go to America and get a jet license? So they said to me, basically, at a meeting in uh, Harlem, just north of Amsterdam, can you go over and do a jet line? I went, yeah, I can do it easy. Right? I said, flying a jet is just the same, same principle as flying a small plane, right? Just with a bit more technicality. So they said, well, what we do is we'll give you a Learjet, right? We'll buy you a Learjet and it's yours all year. You can use it. We pay for the fuel. We pay for the airport storage. You can take your friends on holiday. You can use it when you want. However, twice a year, you've got to take, bring two tons of Coke from Brazil into North Africa. And I went, tell them I'll do it. I'll do it no problem, right? So obviously I'm not talking to them. They won't meet me. I'm just talking to the buffer right in between. So he said, you won't have a problem, mate. I said, not at all, mate. So anyway, they agreed that I'd go over to Florida. I'd do the jet course, which was six weeks, right? They'd give me the Learjet. Then twice a year, I'd have to fly from Brazil into a place called Mauritania. Have you heard of it? No. It's a country in North Africa. Land at Mauritania where I'm under full protection of the police, right? Because they're corrupt, right? And the rest of the year, they would give me a million dollars per run. Right? So I do one run over, a million dollars. Three months later, I do another run over, a million dollars. That's all I have to do from all year. And I've got the Learjet all year to take my friends on holiday, my girlfriend out to lunch, everything. And it was all agreed. And then about two weeks later, I got next with this. Where do you think you'd have ever stopped? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'll tell you what, it was, when, when I, I came back home and I thought about it, I thought, this is what I really want to do. You know, get the get the Learjet, land it in Brazil. Um, they were going to fit extra uh, tanks in it, 
to, to give it the range, right? Because I think the Learjet, I think it's got a range of about 1,200 miles, right? But they were going to fit extra tanks in it that give it a range of about 2,500 miles. Well, out of this patch that they had, they owned in the Brazilian jungle to Mauritania was about 2,200 miles, so it'd have been okay. Um, and I loved it, you know, I loved every minute of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I got caught, you know. And that's a lifer in Brazil, or a lifer, and possibly shot one in the head as well, do you know what I mean? The only danger I, I, I thought was, right, if, if there was ever... Uh, the, the people in Amsterdam wouldn't turn on me, but if anyone was going to rip them off, say the people in Mauritania, I'm the first that gets shot. Mm -hmm. You know, if they suddenly go, well, hang on a minute, we got two t two tons of coke at that time was roughly seventy two million pounds. I can tell you the price of it, right? Seventy two million. People will kill you for that, mm -hmm. right? So I didn't have any fear of my people in Amsterdam. They fucking love me, right? They're not, they're going to protect me. But what about the blokes on the ground in Mauritania who are getting paid off by the guys in Amsterdam, but suddenly instead of getting like 100 grand, they look at 72 million in the plane and I'm driving it. Yeah, it's a different ball game. When was the moment in prison we decided, okay, I'm going to stick to my guns and I'm not going to get involved in crime again. Was it a few years later or was it straight after your sentence? I think, I think it was straight after I got out, actually, because uh, a couple of a couple of people did contact me. Uh, one, one, one team from North London said, just name the plane you want to buy. We'll buy the plane, but you obviously, you've got to fly stuff in for us. And um, what had happened was... I was placed on the voice recognition system at Cheltenham. You know, the H G H C Q, yeah. G GCHQ, mm -hmm. right? Well, they spent 20, I don't know if you know this, right? That building and the equipment in it came to 20 billion pounds. They can listen to conversations. There was a, an uprising in Nigeria. They were getting conversations coming from the middle of the jungle, right? So what chance have you got in the, in the English channel? So I thought, it, you know, and sometimes you do have to use a radio, you know, you get, especially if it's bad weather or you're in trouble or whatever. And I thought, no, I can't, I can't do it. And no, 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 my voice was on the voice recognition system at GCHQ. Well, I was told that, I was warned about it. Um, so I, I turned it down, you know. So what, what do you do when you come out then? You've just done a live sentence, like probably on your ass again, probably back to square one. Saturday. No, I weren't back to square one. And I'll tell you why I went back to square one. I can say this now because I've done the sentence. Most of my money that I earned through the runs, because what it is, someone drops you, goes past in the car, which happened on one occasion, and dropped me £36,000 on my lap, right? What'd you do with it? You can't fucking bank it. You can't go, you know, I mean, it's, it's pound notes are a dodgy situation to have in this country. So what I did was I used to make them keep my money over in Amsterdam, right? I used to go down to a, a contact that was part of the, the group who actually run the show, and I would buy diamonds off him for cash, right? I would then drive down to Antwerp, sell the diamonds at Antwerp, but get a check. Right? <laughs> then the check would go into my Luxembourg account. And the police spent a year searching through Luxembourg trying to find my account. Never got it. What, under Sidney William Wright? Do you think I'm stupid? <laughs> <laughs> it was never going to be in my name, mm -hmm. right? So they say, so they allege. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not to say whether that story is true or not, right? It may or may not be. You know, people make their mind up. But I used to change the diamonds up at Antwerp and, and, and turn it into checks. I, I'd lose a bit. On, a, on, say, 50 grand, I'd probably lose about five or 6,000 into the value of the stones. So I'd buy the stones for 50,000, but I'd go to Antwerp and only get checks for 46. But happy days. It was clean. Clean. So when you came out then, what's going through your mind? Like you've done a life sentence, you've got a bit of dough tucked by, you've been offered big jobs. Like, was the temptation always there, Sydney, to go back to your old yeah, ways? Yeah, definitely. Definitely, the temptation's always there. I'll tell you one of the reasons why. Not for greed for money, because I've got enough now to live the rest of my life really comfortably, honestly, I really have. 
and I won't make the silly same mistakes by taking chances. I'm too old for it. Um, but the, the the reason that I wouldn't uh, go back into 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 crime now is is just the age factor and then the you know it's a young man's game really. It's a, you know to be to be involved in it to that extent. Um, it's not something that I really want to do. Yeah, you can't be messing about with your time in life now. Like... No, no, the time I've got left on this planet, I mean, you know, pray, pray to God, I want to now just enjoy it and relax back, you know, have a few nice holidays, uh, perhaps buy a villa out in Tenerife is what I, I intend to do. Don't be shit, I'm harsh in that back of sudden when you're over there. <laughs> I, won't, I, won't, I won't get involved in it. <laughs> you've said that for I the mean, last fucking 50 years and everything yeah, you've been involved in. I mean, now I'm banned from flying. Take a license. But I'm, I'm, only, I'm only banned in England. I'm yeah, still but, flying Spain. Yeah, but his own fucking Colombia is, is perfect for that. Well, yeah. If you're looking for a co-pilot, fuck it, give me a shout. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, the funny, one of the funny things, I saw a film once with Pablo, I don't know if you saw this film, but it showed you Pablo and Escobar's ranch. Mm -hmm. And above the gate to the ranch, it had an aeroplane as a model there. And it was the first aeroplane that he ever done a run in, Pablo Escobar, right? And fuck me, do you know what? It was the same colour and same plane that I had. He still put the blame on that. It was a Cessna 150, yeah. <laughs> the first plane that I ever had, right? And it was above his ranch gates in um, somewhere in Colombia, the Medellin cartel, wasn't it, they were? Yeah. Ain't it mad, though, from selling a pound of hash to then talking about shipping tons of fucking kilos of, of coke for Brazil that yeah. it's a mad how, how fast it can go your life right. and, and, and the only reason they they they, they said uh, well the two obviously money but they trusted me when I was chased by the customs uh, I could have easily said that I ditched the gear ditched everything right and kept it and made money out of it right there was supposedly, reputedly, right, by the police, 10 kilos that, that, night, that night, right? So I could have easily kept 360,000 pound for myself, but I didn't, right? I told them exactly where the drop was and that, and they found it two days later, right? They knew I was honest. You know, if I'm working with someone, and if you ain't honest, I mean, I'll give you an idea. I went over there in, must have been about 207, right? Anyway, my mate unusually wanted to meet me up in Harlem, right? So I've gone north of Amsterdam to Harlem and we've gone to this restaurant, right? And we've gone to this restaurant and I thought, this, this is unusual. We don't normally do this, right? And I had some money. I had some diamonds to sort out and I had some money to take down to Luxembourg and that. And I thought, this is a bit strange. And there was a fella there that I didn't recognise, right? Anyway, so... It all went down sweetly. I got my stuff, I bought the diamonds, went down to Antwerp, got the checks and banked it, everything done. It later turned out that the bloke that's sitting at the table was a hired assassin, right? This is a true story. You check with the police on this. Now, that weekend, without me knowing, right, because I don't know, I've only just flown over there in my plane, right? He had murdered three geezers that had turned this firm over that I worked for, for money. I don't know, what it, I mean, rumour had it there was 100 kilos of coke involved, right? But I don't know, because it's only a rumour, right? Now, I didn't know that this bloke's an assassin. How would I know, right? But they've got, got us on camera in the fucking restaurant. Now, I'm arrested in England, like we know, in 2008, like I told you, and I'm on remand, right? Guess who turns up in the cell next to me, right, in Chelmsford? The fucking assassin, the man. right? Now, I'm not stupid and he's not stupid, right? He knows me, but I don't know. At this time, I don't know the assassin. I went, what are you doing here, sir? And so he went, I ain't got a clue. He said, apparently they've found my, my DNA on a bullet case in, in Amsterdam where three people were wiped out. I went, what? He went, and I, I mean, I'd heard about it, but only, only a whisper. So he said... Uh, yeah, they said, they've got my DNA on a bullet case in. He said, now he knows that they've put him next door to me and they've bugged the cells trying to get us to talk, right? But I genuinely didn't know anything about it. And he's too clever to fall for that, for that type of trick. 
he went, I don't know what they're talking about, uh, mate. He said, uh, you know, they've got me on this, this, and the Dutch police came over, questioned him for about four days, then they had to release him. But he wiped out three geezers over there, this bloke. And it was over, uh, obviously, stolen cocaine. Mm -hmm. So you've went through it all, you've been out of prison your whole life, you've made dough, you've lost it, you've made it back, you've got out, you've got a bit of dough tucked by that. What's your life like then? Obviously the temptation's always going to well, be there. now? Yeah. Well now, no, I just, I just take it easy. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I've got uh, uh, just a few months left on my license to do for probation and that. Um, my, my, my license runs out in February and uh, I just aim to stay free and, and in good health, mm -hmm. you know? How was it writing the book? The Last London Gangster, like, how was that? Experience? Yeah, it was it was fantastic because I, I mean, there's some of the stuff in there is not how it happened. Um, yeah, you had to change a few things. I had to change a few things because they said to me, if I wrote the exact story of what happened with my smuggling and that, it would be considered proceeds of crime. Um, so I had to change a few names and change a few situations and change a few locations, but a great deal that happened, including the murders in Amsterdam, are all in there. Mm -hmm. um, and the story behind uh, how the murders happened and that are all in there. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, it's, it's basically, it's probably about 70% true and 30% I had to meander around. Yeah. Where can people buy your book, Sydney? Um, it's on Amazon Prime. You go on the, the internet, Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, either put in my name or the Last London Gangster, and it comes down to. Uh, I think it's for Kindle. It's about two quid, and for for the for the book itself, like that in paperback form, is about twelve quid. No ever. But it's all five star. I mean, I I, I I wrote it, and I'm actually surprised. It's all five star reviews all the ways down uh, down and on it. No ever came forward to turn this into a film yet. Uh, no, no. People, some one or two people before I come out of prison spoke about it, um, but nothing's come to fruition about a film on it. But it's there to be read, and anyone that reads it, it's not just like some chance who has sat down to write a book. I did three, four years of political comment and uh, and. Uh, uh, journal uh, journalism in itself before I wrote it, so it's a quality read. It mm -hmm. really is. Yeah, fair play for turning your life around, getting your book out. And yeah, some people watch this to be blown away. I've thoroughly enjoyed your story. It's a great story. Obviously, you've lived that life. That yeah, thank you. But for what's your plans for the future going forward, Sydney? Oh, uh, the plans for the future now is just to live live back in retirement. Um, I go down, I'm keen on boats. Um, I've got a 30 foot cruiser, flybridge cruiser I go out on. Uh, I've got a nice jet ski. Um, I still love motorbikes and motorcycles. So I've, I've got a, a Yamaha R1200 and I've got a, a nice scooter as well. Just things that you enjoy in life, you know, without being involved in crime. I could go out and have a wonderful day driving around London on a motor scooter mm -hmm. and really enjoy it, honestly. Thrill seeker, and that's where you're going to get your buzz. It's different, obviously, if you're in a plane full of drugs and guns, you'll be buzzing out your tits. Do you know what I mean? That adrenaline blush you'll never ever get again. I'm going to no. be honest with you, no matter if you're on a motorbike that's hitting 300 no, miles an hour. But what do you think, looking back at your life, that like, in all honesty, do you miss it? Do you miss that madness? Yeah, yeah, you do, right? But, but the I'll tell you what, you don't miss the feeling when you do get nicked or when it do, does come on top. You know, I don't miss that at all, obviously. Uh, and you reach a certain, I mean, if I was 45 now, I'd probably been planning the next move. But I'm in mid-60s now, and you know what? It's, it, it's, sometimes it's time to slow down, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and just live your life for, just for the simple things. How did you go over the dark days, Sydney? Like, the days you really struggled, like, in prison, and when you get out, like... Oh, with a sack full of antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I didn't. No, um... I'll tell you one of, one of the ways you get over it is, is and it may sound, may sound a bit corny, but going to the gym. You know, if you go down to the gym, sometimes you're, I feel a bit low, whatever. I go down to the gym, I have a nice workout. I mean, I still train on a heavy bag, punching and that. I have a nice swim, sauna and steam room, and you come out and feel a million dollars again, you know? Yeah. How uh, do you feel talking about your story, Sydney? Bring yeah, back a lot of emotion. 
I, 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 I speak about it quite openly because I've done the time for it. I've paid the price, mm -hmm. you know. Um, if I had done that 17 years in prison, I wouldn't be sitting in now talking to you, you know. That's what I felt then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, but the fact that I've done it, I can speak about it, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's quite cathartic. Yeah. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? No, no, no. I just hope people will watch it and, and enjoy what, our conversation and... Uh, you know, enjoy the story that I've told. Yeah, that's all do well. We all live in And if, if they them. if they want to buy my book um, and read it, as I say, read the. I'll tell you what I'd recommend to people: read the reviews first. The people that are on there, there's about seventy five reviews. So it ain't a question of just a few friends writing good things about me. Um, and they're all four and five star reviews. Um, and the quality of the, of the of the writing on it will probably surprise people. Yeah, I can assure you the sales will go up after this podcast. Like, great story, mad life. That like, people are intrigued by this life, and I've never heard anybody from the UK flying their own gear back and forth. Like, Thank you. It's a mad story, and you're still here to tell the tale. Great read, Sydney. I wish nice. you all the best for the future, brother. That's no, been a pleasure. And, uh, God bless you. Thanks for coming Thank on. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.